this is the time that we're now back to it. So can we all please welcome Dr. Crawley? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the people that you bring into our lives. I'm thankful for just a little chance I got to meet you and uh, your students at UK, and I'm grateful for this chance to um, interact again, that we can benefit from the work that she's doing. We know that you, your Holy Spirit, is present in the work that we do, uh, and this is important work. We're thankful that you called and led uh, Dr. Crawley to this, that we can benefit from it. But we pray that you bless us this morning as we listen to this, not just that we can uh, gather information. Uh, but also that we might see something of your truth, and your goodness, and your love, and your mercy uh, uh, for your children. We all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know why. I need to figure out the setting that turns us on. Thank you. 
even though spirituals in the United States are primarily associated with the oral traditions from the ethnic cultural group presently identified as African American, the concept Negro places the dialogue in its historical context. Negro was used to describe Americans of African descent as well as Africans perceived through the Euro-American perspective during the late 1800s to early 1900s when the concert spiritual arrangement was a highly sought performance medium. Replacing the term Negro for the purposes of remaining inoffensive also serves to overlook the historical condition of African Americans in the United States. It is appropriate to accept the term the composers, arrangers, and discussion adopted, and that includes the work second and third. Therefore, when referring to the historical spiritual Negro is standard as a preceding adjective. However, for the remainder of this discussion, and what most people do, the Negro spiritual will be shortened to spiritual, spiritual, or the spiritual, since it is implied what type of music is in consideration. song is a precursor to the spirituals, uh, and I really like that answer. Uh, Ring Shout is another answer, but as far as what culture Negro spirituals come from, there's been debate on that, so I'm going to discuss that for a minute. Negro spirituals from the United States are not solely African, but they are cumulatively and ultimately African-American. In current scholarship, there is still debate about who can lay claim to spirituals. It is difficult to determine the period during which spirituals became a distinct classification of music, mainly because there was no interest in collecting the songs before the early 1800s, and correspondence that did describe the character of the spirituals was not always preserved. And that, again, means no taking. There has been extensive debate lasting through the 20th century concerning whether the Negro spiritual was an imitation of white gospel song. The scholars that argued on behalf of white origins of the spiritual were Richard Polachek, Louis Benson, Newman Ivy White, and George Pullen Jackson. Advocating for black origins were journalists and composers and scholars as well as critics, including Henry Edward Crable, James Weldon Johnson, Dana Epstein, William Talmadge, and John Lovell. These debates were centered on what was left of African culture after the slave trade. There have been many arguments concerning whether the Negro spiritual is an imitation of white gospel song. Okay? But before an irrefutable argument can truly be made, one must first consider the distinction between the terms imitation and reassembly that the works point in regard to Negro spiritual influence. Imitation or imitating means to follow as a pattern, model, or example, or to produce a copy of. Reassemble means to bring or put together the parts of something again. Mastering this difference requires an observation of the precursors to spirituals. One predecessor and probably the most important and the earliest uh, to the African American spiritual is the ring shout, which derived from African culture and is a combination of music and dance first performed in the United States by African American slaves, usually as part of a religious ceremony. These dances were practiced in a circle, and the music would get faster and faster until the spirit took possession. The ring shouts descend from ring rituals of West Africa and were recreated by the slaves in the United States in the early 1700s. The slaves were influenced by or converted to Christianity and Anglo-American Hennedy, which also contributed to spirituals. The most widely known events to be documented are of participants combining characteristics of ring shouts 
and Hemody at camp meetings during the Second Great Awakening. This is roughly around 1790 to 1840. Both white and black individuals attended these meetings. It was necessary to create music without notation because many people could not read words, let alone music. Black and white worshipers combined traditional hymns, refrains, repetition, popular tunes, improvisation, and call and response to form what is known as the camp meeting spirit. Because of the context from which they sprang, individuals did not compose spirituals. They created them in collaboration with others. People initiated an original song and the community added to it and they call and response texture and form. With this in mind, when we consider the thought of reassembly, we see how the spiritual with all the components aforementioned is not merely an imitation, it becomes something entirely different. Yeah, I don't know why my PowerPoint got out of order, but I know what I'm doing. So, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> So now let's talk about the text, the spirit. Now, um, Andrew, you mentioned the fact that it's a biblical base, and that's right down. That's the text is one of the most defining characteristics of the spiritual. Spiritual texts derive from scripture, from a religious experience, or imagination of a religious experience. They may also address topics of home, prayer, humility, the King James Version of the Bible is the source for the sacred text the songwriters utilize, which is the result of England's influence on the United States language and the Anglican Church's usage of this version. Although the language is English, the text linguistics is a combination of American and African dialects. The spirituals recounted stories from both the Old and the New Testament. So you got Daniel and the lion's den, and that song is Did My Lord Deliver Daniel. It's a pretty interesting one. I don't have it today, but you should go listen to it. God delivering his people through Moses from Pharaoh slash slavery and go down Moses. The birth of Jesus and go tell it on the mountain. That is a particular arrangement of John Work the Third. That's what he's known for. Go tell it on the mountain. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion and were you there? And Jesus' resurrection and he rose. African Americans also understood a code of context associated with spirituals that could only be understood through the lens of the African American experience, particularly during slavery. For example, Go Down Moses was metaphorical, was a metaphorical spiritual because Moses represented guides or conductors. So the most famous one was Harriet Tubman of the Underground Railroad. Just as Moses was the deliverer of his people, the Hebrews, Conductors of the Underground Railroad led the African American slaves to freedom. Other spirituals with coded messages were "Steal away," "Follow the drinking board," "Wade in the water," in particular. I have a yeah, a little small diagram of uh, what the word, what the code word for. So you have Egypt, Babylon. I guess I could look here, or um, hell in spiritual represent land of enslaved people or the southern region of the United States. And Pharaoh or Satan were slave owners or anyone who treats slaves badly. Israelites were slaves. Pharaoh's army were patrollers or uh, people searching for escaped slaves. And Jesus was anyone who had interest in slave freedom and uh, crossing over the Jordan River in reality was the Ohio River. Um, and the promised land uh, was could be considered Africa, but also the north of the United States, Canada, uh, heaven, uh, because a lot of spirituals speak upon um, the afterlife as the ultimate goal, right? Similar to the metaphorical language of spirituals, pronouns in the lyrics sometimes contain veiled meanings. Pronouns, y'all. I often meant we as in the community negatively uh, affected by slavery, the ones that were held captive. Because of this device, spirituals were community-based and served several functions. The religious context of spirituals were invoked during worship, baptisms, and burials. Non-religious functions were codes for escape, but also lullabies, work songs, and social settings. 
The usage of spirituals in non-religious settings shows just how much the African American community integrated Christianity into its everyday life. Rhythm. Anyone know what the rhythm for spirituals is? It's pretty easy. I'm not gonna go into it. I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and demand a question. Rhythm, form, and texture, and style also help distinguish a spiritual from other genres. Syncopation dominated most spirituals, and performers and listeners established a duple or triple meter. On the other hand, some spiritual performances had a free rhythm, and this was particularly during a prayer or sermon. The rhythm was important to Negro folk songs, and the singers would even add or subtract syllables from a phrase in order to fit them into the meter. This is one of the reasons singers practice African American vernacular dialect to pronounce their lyrics. So this is uh, something that we uh, we make assumptions that the spirituals are in the African American dialect because uh, at that time people could not speak standard American English. But uh, actually, uh, the primary reason was to fit certain words into the beat because the rhythm was so important and we can just we can cut out the whole going to and just say gonna, you know, like in the South, okay, we're gonna do this, that's two syllables as opposed to three, so you can fit it into the beat. But I go on all day about the vernacular dialect, but this class is not all day, so let's move on. <laughs>
again, that's the Fish Jubilee Singers. I tried to get all a lot of Fish Jubilee Singers songs going on, uh, just because of the nature of the topic and you know, talking about work a lot. He was the director at the time. The next uh, one represents that sustained long phrase melody, and this is a uh, There's a Bomb in Gilead. Anyone ever heard this one? It's my favorite joke. They used to sing the song more in church growing up. Anytime they sang There's a Bomb in Gilead, I'd always go, Get the people out of there! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
the usage of fourth and seventh major scale steps are not usually practiced, leaving the pentatonic scale as the primary form. However, the spiritual utilizes more than just the pentatonic scale. The flat third and seventh scale degrees appear often. The flat third was a direct feature of the blues, thereby revealing the spiritual and blues melody's relationship to one another. Works analysis of the spiritual melody is a philosophical commonality with his father, Work II, who exposed what he thought was the reason behind the usage of this sequence very poetic quote. The Negro in his primitive nature, I wanna, I wanna address that in a second, let me finish the quote. <laughs> Expressed his musical scale, one, two, three, five, six. Why? That was all the world meant to him. But the American Negro has gone one step further and added one more note, the flat seven. In addition, which goes a long way toward expressing the effect of added experience brought to him by a new life in a new world. This flat seven expresses a wild and overwhelming surprise at the utter strangeness of things. So no one scale dominated the spiritual structure, really. Uh, gap scales were common, and they were supposed to give the listeners a hearing of both major and minor simultaneously to communicate a uniquely personal experience. Um, but I do want to just, just address a, a word, because I don't use apologists, and we just got to do it today. A uh, primitive in here um, should be understood as innately instinctive. This is not to be understood as African American being uncivilized. I would, uh, if you're doing a paper, I would steer clear of the word primitive unless you uh, plan to address what you meant by it in the footnotes thoroughly. Okay? A little bit of advice. Guys, who are the fish you believe singers? He's got friends. What do they do? Well, besides uh, these beers, what do you know for? Well, my friend William goes to the Tennessee University and he's saying, uh, they like, well, they, before COVID, they used to tour. Yeah, they did. Um, like, I know, I think they went to uh, New York this freshman, our freshman year, um, and they tour and just sing. It's not just an audition. Oh, yeah. They're really good. Really. Yeah, they're, they're definitely audition based because I couldn't get you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the Fish Jubilee singers are uh, important to the performance practice of spirituals, which I'm about to get into. Um, but uh, they are responsible for taking the spiritual and introducing them to the world. But they did it in a way um, that was more conservative, let me say, but, or a way that would uh, make a white ticket buying, buying audience is more comfortable with the idea. It is important to note that all three John works either directed uh, members of the Fifth Jubilee Singers, and this group was integral in the preservation of the Negro spirituals. They began when the school's financial situation threatened to close the institution in 1871. George L. White, treasurer of Fisk at the time, selected 12 students and began more than two years of training to prepare them for a tour that would help raise money for the school. White's version of the spiritual recasted the harmony as diatonic and relied heavily on primary triads and dominant seven chords. Dialect was exercised only where it was important to the expression of the lyrics. White altered the essence of the original spiritual while crafting something that white ticket buying audiences would find intriguing. Once they began touring, the program featured spirituals, but also presented a substantial portion of classical repertoire in the program. And that's something you won't get from them today. They're going to sing exclusively spirituals, but they're not going to pop out anything else. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, uh, subsequently, singing groups from all across the United States began to travel and perform these stylized arrangements as well. These groups later published their arrangements. John Work II and Frederick Work published a couple of collections of spiritual songs gathered from their field work in Nashville, the Fisk University family area, and the Little South, where three followed their footsteps. Um, so the Fisk Jubilee singer, you can say, uh, for lack of better words, popped off this whole idea of 
we should take this tradition and make sure that it's documented and you know, well preserved. Because um, that was a time post Civil War that uh, African Americans didn't really care to go back down that road, knowing what the history of spirit was, what they were used for, and the, the, you know, the negative um, environment that uh, surrounded that. So they didn't want to go back to it. The history of these things just kind of uh, made it popular and made people more interested. I mean, it's kind of money to save the school, right? A ton of money? They made some money to save the school. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah they, it was pretty substantial back then, and um, um, there's a lot of research on that in particular. And then after uh, they made that money by touring, they uh, published these songbooks and made money from the songbooks as well. So it's a gift that keeps on giving, or it kept on giving. Um, so, yeah, performance practice. The success of the Jubilee Singers also led to an evolving performance practice of spirituals. Now remember, the way that spirituals were sung pre-Civil War are very different from the way the Jubilee Singers had sung them around the world, and very different from the way we hear them now. Singers altered the tune during repetition of the verse, of course, by adding slides, shakes, melismas, microtones, and moans, cries, and shouts. This style is a critical element of performance practice. The performance of spirituals has become more intricate over the years, largely because of arrangements. The vocal lines as well as the accompaniment have grown richer tonally as well as more rhythmically complex. These technical changes are more challenging for performers who want to be more expressive versus rote. Arranged spirituals as opposed to the spiritual or war tradition have changed consistently since 1900 to uh, fit the international concert repertoire. Some of the major changes were strict voice beating instead of community untrained singing, the adoption of the commonly known Americanized English instead of Hebrew dialect, exact intonation instead of unpredictable pitches, refined vocals instead of raw timbres, tight posture instead of percussive and expressive bodies, and particular dynamic contrast instead of personal indistinct dynamics. And this is where I'm gonna go off on my soapbox real quick. So the spiritual will largely change uh, due to George White and uh, some other director, earlier directors uh, uh, taking what they heard and transcribing it into something that was very Western. Um, however, John Work III came along and he started, uh, he began transcribing it as best as he remembers it being original. So he would add these different um, annotations in his songbook as well. It says Google Meter, but it's very syncopated and you should clap like this. So, uh, Work the Third is responsible not only for preserving the idea of the spiritual, but preserving the original sound as well, or how he thought of it as and how his uh, uh, father and uncle and those before him thought of uh, or sang the spirit. So, in summary, the characteristics of the spiritual that I mentioned above were a result of the efforts of the work family, particularly the second and the third. And I hope this gives everyone a clearer understanding of the complexities behind the creation of this genre. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, these are just the pictures that I gathered from my dissertation research. This one right here is of the work home. It's still in Nashville right now. I'm not sure what they're doing with it, but you can't go in there for tours, but it's been renovated to be a weird yellow and brown color. I'm yellow. But the <coughs> Working Third family, uh, they lived here. They uh, Working Third also taught lessons from this home, and it's, um, it's a historical landmark at this point. Uh, these are clippings of the Fish Jubilee Singers. This is before they went on the European tour. This is while they were at the uh, in Europe tour. And this uh, picture right here is particularly special. It is a bust of John Work III that uh, rests in the chapel at Fisk University. It's still there. It was commissioned, uh, uh, a student was commissioned to complete it in 1977. And uh, that's how much Fisk admires work. Actually, the alma mater, you know the song, the school song, uh, was uh, written by him. And we still sing it at the end of Every single 
So, <laughs> yeah. But um, that is all. I hope you enjoyed or learned something new about spirituals today. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take questions. I know we're going to have any questions. Okay, so it's in North Nashville. Uh, Jefferson Street. Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. uh, what else is down that way? Yeah, it's down if, in Jefferson Street. It's, 